Good evening. I appreciated that. Right? <laughs> um, my name is John Weinstein. I'm the Provost and Vice President here at Bard Academy and Bard College at Simons Rock. And I'm very excited to welcome you to our fourth Founders Day celebration, where we are honoring the 114th birthday of our founder, Elizabeth Blodgett Hall. Let's, let's, yeah. um, this is our second Founders Day lecture. And actually, I'm reflecting that for me, it's my first that I'm getting to attend in person. Because last year, when we had the first one, I was on a trip to Taiwan, so actually I was watching this event on my phone while riding in a car. So those of you out in our Zoomosphere, um, we're very happy to have you with us, and I hope your viewing is as pleasurable as it was for me that time, but it is really great to be here in person. I'm seeing all these wonderful people here in our space um, for this evening when we are going to be uplifting a really important element that may not be hitting the headlines these days in the news, but it is an incredibly important topic to uplift, and this is the education of the Afghan people, particularly Afghan women, and we're really very excited to have Friba Rizai here with us this evening to celebrate all of the work that she's done and all these important and vital issues. Here, let's do that. Simon's Rock, as part of the larger Bard College network, has been part of a, a movement that is across many colleges, but should be across many more, to help find educational opportunities for Afghan students, and we're deeply proud of this work. Um, so this evening, um, to introduce our speaker, I'm very excited to welcome Dina DeMent Myers, who is our newest member of the Board of Overseers and a force of nature in her own right, and she is here to introduce Freeba for you. Dina. Thank you, John. Uh, good evening, and welcome to the second annual Founders Day Lecture here at Bard College at Simons Rock. Like John said, I am Dina DeVent Myers, and I am the newest member of the Simon Rock Board of Overseers, and I'm thrilled to be here. Today marks the 114th anniversary of the birthday of the founder, Elizabeth Blodgett Hall, and we're delighted to mark this occasion with tonight's speaker, Friba Razi'i. Um, Friba is the founder and executive director of the Women's Leadership of Tomorrow and its leadership in the sports project known as GOAL, which is Girls of Afghanistan Lead. Born and raised in Kabul, Afghanistan, at the age of 18, Frida made history by competing in judo as Afghanistan's first ever female Olympic judo athlete in the 2004 Olympic Games in Athens. Freeva's participation in the Olympics brought Afghanistan back to the world stage in sports after the fall of the Taliban. She inspired hundreds of other Afghan girls to join different sports in a sports revolution for Afghan female athletes. Currently, she resides in Vancouver, uh, British Columbia, Canada, and holds a bachelor's degree in political science from the University of British Columbia. Freeba has been an outspoken and passionate advocate for women and girls in education, gender equality, and human rights, and women's rights in, the, in Afghanistan and worldwide. From, she's done this work from an early age to today. She's worked as an educator in the Vancouver school system, and currently she's the manager of the Afghan Women's Employment Program at the YWCA Metro Vancouver area. In addition, she holds a NCCP Level 1 Certificate in the Sport of Judo and is certified with Judo Canada to teach women self-defense. Among me the many reasons we are proud to welcome Freeba is the meaning of her work to young people and young scholars studying with us now as part of BARD's Refugee Initiative. She's an inspiration to us all. Freeba's talk tonight is entitled, The Taliban's Gender Apartheid, where education is a crime. Please join me in welcoming to the stage, Friba Riazi. Well, good evening, everyone. It's, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here. Um, just bear with me for one second. Yes. 
Thank you so much, Bard College at Simon's Rock, for inviting me and giving me this opportunity and honor, honor to stand before you and speak about a very important topic. As Tina kindly mentioned, I'm Freiba. I was born and raised in Afghanistan. That's me when I competed at the 2004 Athens Olympic Games. I know, I was cute, right? <laughs> I was only 18 years old. So my mother wanted me to have a very traditional role and have a long hair and be like a very, very nice, um, obedient Afghan girl. But instead, I cut my hair very short and dyed it red. She was not happy about it, but I really enjoyed it. And in judo, it was very handy. And uh, my participation at the Olympic was a sports revolution for hundreds of um, other Afghan women. Other Afghan women joined different sports, martial arts, basketball, soccer, you name it, Afghan women played and practiced in Afghanistan. The title of my speech is The Taliban's Gender Apartheid, Where Education is a Crime. Let's look at the context of which global media and politicians have moved on from paying detailed attention to what's going on in Afghanistan. There is a truly stipend in its amount of strife, chaos, and armed conflict going on in the world right now. To recap, here are some of the headlines. We have seen the Russian invasion of Ukraine, War in Gaza, civil wars in Yemen, Sudan, and South Sudan, military dictatorship in Myanmar, and guerrilla insurgency, coup d'etat in Mali, Niger, Gabon, and other regional countries, where one of the primary security is the ISIS. The threat to all these countries is the ISIS, ideologically very similar to the Taliban civil wars in Ethiopia and Libya that remain unresolved and in a very tense situation. The Somalian people are fighting against Al-Shabaab for control of their country, also an organization extremely similar to the Taliban. As far, more than just going on right now, and one of the conflicts I just mentioned is worthy of an entire speech and research from anyone from those countries. The reason why I have mentioned all of those conflicts is to point out that the world's attention has been moved on from Afghanistan. The present reality is this. The Taliban has completely closed all forms of higher education for women. In many regions of the country, the Taliban has issued a firm edict that women must not be allowed to attend the school above sixth grade. In other regions of the country, even more hardline Taliban have issued an edict banning female education above third grade. High schools are completely shut down for women. Women are banned from going to college and, un and or universities. Women are banned from leaving the her home, unless accompanied by a responsible male family member such as brother, husband, or father. Women are banned from leaving the country or traveling outside of her hometown or city without, a, without an accompanying male family member. Women are banned from professional jobs and educated careers. The only work options available to women now, which are officially approved by the Taliban in some areas, are home-based craft businesses such as carpet weaving or traditional domestic tasks. Women are banned from going to the gyms, amateur sports, semi-professional sports, and all other forms of fitness activities, including my sport, judo in which all of the training centers have been closed by the Taliban. Meanwhile, the Afghan men's amateur and professional sports team continues as normal, with the national cricket team traveling internationally for competitions. Nearly every other aspect of how women participate in the economy in the United States, Canada, Europe, and other free nations have been banned or restricted for women in Afghanistan. You name it, whatever it is, and nowadays the present situation is that Afghanistan's most thing, things are available for 
for, for in, in Afghanistan, but only for men. Violating any of what I just mentioned has the Taliban imposed Sharia law punishment of dozens of lashes, whip, and or imprisonment. Men have the freedom to travel wherever they like, attend high school, universities, and open businesses, and so on. The Taliban has given a free reign to men to issue their own edicts and restrict the lifestyle of her, her, his family members as they please. This ultimately stems, stems from the concept of women as property, to be owned and controlled by her father until she is married to her uh, husband, who will become later, who will later, later become her controller, who will also control her lifestyle and however he pleases. Men of all sorts in Afghanistan, whether they are true Taliban believers or not, now have a great degree of latitude to arbitrarily restrict any parts of their sisters' lives, wives' activities, and their daughters' activities. When the Taliban took over the capital, women protested on the streets, but only, they, only to find themselves to be imprisoned and tortured by the Taliban. For all of the reasons I have mentioned above, the Taliban's restrictions on women's rights in Afghanistan meet the definition of the gender apartheid. 50% of the population of a country of 30 million people is now living under a draconian oppressive regime which violates every one of their fundamental human rights. Prior to the collapse of the central government in 2021, women in Afghanistan made significant gains in education, careers, and participation in the economy. Following the late 2001 American-led intervention, which removed the Taliban for the first time, and up to 2021, Kabul nearly quadrupled in population. There was significant economic development with the newly open communications companies, televisions, new businesses of all sorts, shopping malls, condominium, apartment buildings, construction projects, thousands of the projects around the cities. If you look at the pictures from the Associate Press or uh, similar news sources from early 2002, showing a battered, hollowed out shell of a city and compare it to what the city looked like in 2021, Kabul grew very rapidly in a way that was almost impossible to keep track of every change happening there and taking places, even for the people who lived there their entire life. Women were a big part of this. They worked in television media, print journalism, info information technology, accountant, international aid and development projects, and even joined the army. Myself and women of my age saw opportunities available and we used them as we could the best. I was 18 years old in 2004 and many of my peers went on to university professional careers and become active participants in the economy. There was an all girls robotics team composed of young women from grade 11 and 12 grades in high school which built and assembled robot kits and participated in international competitions. Women opened uh, businesses, software, website builder companies. There were female members of parliament and female airline pilots. The country remained a deeply patriarchal and socially conservative environment and equality was nowhere near a true 50-50% gender ratio in anything but women's rights were certainly making a measurable progress every year. In addition to that, the literacy rate went up for women, which was a big part of women's empowerment because that helped them get jobs, and once they had jobs, they had incomes. Highly respected international organizations that still pay attention to Afghanistan have been ringing the alarm bell about the severe reversal of gender rights in the country. But who is listening? As the news of the Taliban's takeover is now two and a half years old, only those people with a very compelling reason to who pays attention are watching the news about Afghanistan and Afghan women. The world is distracted by bloody and brutal conflicts in Gaza and Ukraine. The United Nations, 
Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, and similar organizations have published detailed and extensive reports of the violation of women's rights in Afghanistan. So how did this happen? I have previously spoken to numbers of universities, groups, academics, and different seminars about what caused the collapse of the government which was internationally supported, including the United States. It's an extremely complicated topic with dozens of factors and interrelated problems that, are, that resulted in the collapse. The shortest possible summary is that it's true that there was endemic systematic and severe corruption in both Hamid Karzai and Ashraf Ghani governments throughout all branches, almost, for almost 10 years before the collapse of the government, the Taliban controlled vast areas of rural territories outside of the 18 to largest cities. The Taliban always operated so-called a shadow government in their ruler heartlands in which their self-appointed Sharia law courts dispensed justice and dealt with the family issues and land issues. The endemic corruption in the federal government's police forces and military caused many people to lose trust in the government, and the Taliban's so-called justice was seen as a better alternative. At the same time, much of the economic development and boom that took place in the large cities like Kabul, Herat, and Mazar-e-Sharif never made it to the most rural areas of the country. People living a substance agriculture lifestyle in remote areas never saw anything good from the central government. For some of them, literally, the only time they interacted with the government was when some corrupt local police from the Ministry of Interior extorted them for a bribe. The police forces set up and organized by the Americans and international forces were paid a salary which was barely $200 a month. And, a very, and very often the billions of dollars of international aid and assistance provided by the U.S. siphoned off in corruption in Kabul before any resources made it to the remote areas of the country. Part of the problem was the structural of the government set up by the 2001 intervention, Bonn Conference and the new constitution. Did you know that the constitution allowed President uh, Karzai and Ashraf Ghani to directly appoint provincial governors, regional army commanders, and police commanders? Police commanders in many districts saw their new position as an opportunity to extort money from the local population and to steal the salaries of their own men, some of them whom existed only on papers and so-called the ghost soldiers. In many cases, regional so-called politicians were also appointed by the president, became famously corrupted and flaunted wealth which had no obvious legitimate source. Golaga Sherzai, as the governor of Ningarhar province, with the important city of Jalalabad on the nation's largest trade route in and out of Pakistan, built a gigantic opulent mansion with a massive garden, while the ordinary people of Jalalabad province struggled for the basic necessities of life. The Taliban watched, waited, and presented themselves as the law and order alternative to this. At the same time as things were reaching a truly unstable level in corruption and central government dysfunction, Donald Trump, Mike Pompeo, and others began to engage in the so-called negotiations with the Taliban in 2019 and 2020. In a many months long series of discussions and meetings held in Doha, Qatar, the United States and Taliban signed an agreement that was supposed to engage the Taliban in participating in government as an equal partner, which the promise was that the United States would withdraw its all military forces from the key bases such as Bagram and Kandahar. Kandahar airfields down to the last man. The Taliban in return promised to respect human rights, women's rights, and presented the new and modern face of the reformed Taliban. Right around the same time that the global COVID-19 crisis went into full mode in the spring of 2020, 
That is when, when this deal was finalized and signed by the US State Department and the Taliban representatives. If you remember being on lockdown, watching news about COVID-19, very little attention was paid to Afghanistan and the Taliban. We, know, we now know that the Taliban never really want, intended to do any of things what they promised to Trump and his diplomatic invoice but they were instead biding their time until they saw American military forces fully withdraw. Did you actually know that in 2021, only a few months before of the collapse, the US Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, presently flew, personally flew to Kabul and ordered Ashraf Ghani to release more than 5,000 Taliban prisoners being held in the highest security prison? True story. This was accompanied by a threat to completely cut off the further American funding for the government. At the same time, the Biden administration followed the foolish total withdrawal plan put in place by Trump, and the Americans began a complete and total withdrawal of our armed forces. The Afghan National Army was highly dependent upon the American military support for its logistics, medical evacuations, helicopters, repair of vehicles and aircraft, and collapsed only a few months afterwards. The entire situation regarding how and why the collapse of the Ghani government in 2021 is so complicated that I can't fully address it in this speech. The end result was that Taliban did capture the capital and are presently occupying the capital by armed forces. Their own edicts claim an absolute monopoly on the use of the armed forces in the country, and they have been systematically disarming or defeating whatever small regional pockets of opposite remained, opposition remained. The Taliban has also inherited a vast stockpile of United States provided, NATO provided, specification armaments, ammunition, armed vehicles, armored vehicles, and military supplies which had been given to the previous National Army. They have been making YouTube videos flaunting their Taliban Special Forces units, wearing American-made body armor, helmets, night vision goggles, carrying on American M4 rifles and driving around in armored Humvees. Okay, so Afghans are once again subjugated by the Taliban regime for the second time. What does this mean now? What the Taliban really want? What is their ideology? In short, the Taliban approaches the government from perspective that there should be no distinction between the religious Sharia law and the government. They do not believe in moral legitimacy of secular civil legal code as a general concept. The Taliban's ideology is that if all Muslims were to just follow their particular type of Sharia law, that would be no need for a civil court system or civil legal code and legislation to exist at all, and that everyone would live together in a perfect peace and harmony. Of course, the reality is very different from this, as we can see. What are the origins of their ideology? I recommend everyone reading the Wikipedia page for the Taliban and review the citations and the references related to their origins and formation as a movement in the middle of 1990s. There are at their core Salafist Sunni fundamentalist organization that has its ideological roots in so-called Islamic jihadism of 40 or 50 years in the past. Some of you May, might have read the fam very famous novel, The, Tales, the Handmaid's Tale, or at least seen its uh, television drama adaptation, The Handmaid's Tale. The Taliban's ideology is actually not very different from this. They believe that the only role for women is to be housewives, barefoot, and pregnant in the kitchen. In their view, women should not have any other role in, in the society. Here's something you might not know about the jihadist situation in Afghanistan. About seven or eight years ago, 
when the ISIS was taking its maximum geographical size in Iraq and Syria, occupying Mosul and Raqqa, a regional variant of ISIS formed in Afghanistan. They called themselves ISIS Khurasan, although most Arabic and Farsi speakers know them as Daesh. The massive amount of propaganda being put out by the ISIS organization in 2014 and 2015 resulted in a number of new recruits of bored and unemployed young men. Do you know where the recruits came from? From the Taliban. These were the severe hardliners who decided that the new modern Taliban was too secular for their liking form like ISIS Khorasan group in Afghanistan and began a typical pattern of jihadist terrorist attacks against the civilian population, especially against Shia and ethnic Hazara minorities. Suicide bombers attacked mosques, buses, and crowds of people whom they considered to be infidels. Now, in the post-2021 reality, the Taliban so-called government in Kabul is using English language media talking points, points portraying itself as a counter-terrorist organization. The Taliban knows that ISIS Khurasan and its armed members are a radicalized, motivated group of people who are a dangerous form of political opposition and remain in possession of weapons and ammunition. So they have decided to tell the world that they are the only legitimate force capable of combating them. Imagine how absurd is this? The Taliban now claims to be running counterterrorism organizations and operations against terrorists. Their ideologies and foundation in Salafist, Salafist jihadism are not significantly different. Meanwhile, in the summer of 2022, a year after the Taliban captured the capital, the United States conducted a targeted drone strike on the leader of Al Qaeda, Ayman al Zawahiri, who was previously actually bin Laden's, bin Laden's lieutenant and second in command. Where was al-Zawahiri? The Taliban had him set up in a luxury home in the most expensive district of central Kabul. The United States Department says it has specifically warned the Taliban against continuing to harbor international jihadists or allowing its territory to be, become once again used for al-Qaeda and similar training camps. Maybe this missile strike was a message meant for the Taliban leadership, but how the Taliban can guarantee to the world, given the vast size and complicated geography of Afghanistan, that some of the similar international jihadist organizations are not right now actively plotting, planning, training, and organizing themselves? How can they guarantee that? At the same time, the Taliban has brought television news cameras and photojournalists out to designated poppy fields and made a public show of eradicating opium poppy fields so that they can portray themselves as a legitimate counter-narcotics organization that cares about getting Afghanistan's opium crops under control. This is also completely absurd for all Afghans. If you're an Afghan, because it's extremely <laughs> common knowledge that one of the Taliban's primary revenue sources in the years prior to 2021 in historical homelands and support based in Hilman and Kandahar provinces was the opium poppy crop and smuggling processed heroin out of the country. The massive deterioration of economic situation in Afghanistan following the withdrawal of funding for the government and the Taliban captured the capital also means that Many thousands of young women have been forced into marriage at early age because the Taliban considers a high school education to be irrelevant for women above age 13. And the logical conclusion of this is that they also condone what we in the West call child marriages. Families with large numbers of children in desperate economic circumstances have no choice but to marry off their, their girls as young as 12, 13, 16 years old, to meet much, much older men who promise to take care of them and feed them. This is the reality for many young Afghan women now. A teenage girl who was 14 
two and a half years ago when the Taliban took over and shut down her high school is now 16 years old. She has missed two full years of school. What she will do now? What, is, what can she do? She certainly can't get a job and her education is woefully incomplete and she can't go anywhere without a male family member escorting her. The UNDP estimated that now more than 80,000 child marriages have taken place since the collapse. At the start of my speech, I presented a very long list of ongoing armed conflicts and chaos in the world. Some of the Taliban's most restrictive edicts and crackdowns on the women's rights have been issued with a very suspicious and careful timing. The fall and official shutdown of high school for women was announced at the same week as the Russian invasion of Ukraine began and was barely noticed by the international news sources. These announcements were made the very same day as a massive armored column of Russian vehicles and soldiers were attempting to capture Kyiv, the, the Battle of Hostomol Airport in the north of Ukraine, and the other, other vitally important pivotal recent events in Ukrainians' war for, the, for their defense for their nation. Other similar restrictions and edicts have been put in place with the timing that seems to be designed to attract the bare minimum of, of international attention. It would be a serious mistake for anyone to assume that Taliban is stupid. Their ideology and governance may appear backwards and brutal to international observers, but there is a systematic method to what they are doing. They know that as long as they do not cause any visibly obvious disaster in public, such as using AK-47 to shoot groups of protesters in the streets, that the absence of photographers or videos of their repression will help them stay in power. This is not exactly the same Taliban as we had in the middle of 1990s. When they conducted execution by stoning or bullet to the back of the head of front of a crowd of people in Kabul's largest football stadium. They know that as long as somewhere else in the world, major news organizations are showing other videos of bloody and conflict strife that is more shocking and more gory than what is coming out of Kabul will not put them on the top priority for international news. The Taliban is engaged in a slow motion and gradual suffocation of the country by the religious extremism. They are specifically refraining from what the ISIS did with the public execution posted on social media because they knew it would result in an international backlash. The new modern Taliban has many English-speaking spokespersons, some of whom have been educated in Pakistan. They know how to use rhetorical debating techniques and come up with the plausible sounding talking points when interviewed by the international news media. The present situation is that they had not turned off the internet or forced the national telecom companies to restrict it because they make extensive use of the internet for themselves as well. If I were a Somalian woman, or a woman from Yemen, or Palestinian, or Syrian, I would be standing in front of you here today to ask you to not forget my people and their current suffering. I am from Afghanistan and I ask you, Please do not forget what's happening in Afghanistan and what's happening to women's rights. And don't allow your government to normalize relations with the Taliban. The Taliban has already made significant steps towards diplomatic recognition from China and Russia. With the recently signed trade deals and full reopening of the embassies and diplomatic relations. Of course, the Taliban has no qualms about engaging in friendly relations with non democratic and or authoritarian regimes. Gargachuan, Chinese state controlled mining companies, have recently signed a very public land lease and revenue sharing deal for extraction of Afghanistan's rich copper, lithium, and other mineral deposits. From the point of view on of Afghan, it's really bizarre to see that the Taliban are cozying up with the Putin's regime. And they have a friendly relationship with Sergei Lavrov, Putin's foreign minister. 
It's absurd for any Afghan or anyone who read the history because didn't we have a whole jihad in 1980s to expel the communists and Russian forces from the country? Isn't the fact that some of the origins of the Taliban are in the same 1980s era Mujahideen forces that engage in bloody guerrilla warfare against the Russians? In any case, the new political reality in 2023, the Taliban seem to be good friends with Russia. And the Russia, which has been extensively isolated from diplomatic relations and trade with, with the free world, seems to have no qualms whatsoever with being good friends with the Taliban. As much as the Russian and the Wagner group have been documented to be involved with some of the recent coup d'etat in Africa and Wagner group so-called military assistance to other corrected regimes in that continent. At the start of my speech, I give you a list of a large number of ongoing armed conflicts in the world. We here in the West and countries with a functioning civil society and government should have the capacity and capability to pay attention to more than one or two things at a time. Events going on right now in Gaza and Ukraine are vitally important and their eventual and results and aftermath will shape the world that we see in the next 20, 23 or 20, 20, 40 and beyond. Simultaneously, we must not forget that the longer Taliban remains in power, unchallenged and maintained its its monopoly on armed forces over the country, the more likely it will be that they will be normalized as the so-called government of the country. It's not a government at all. It's a nationwide hostage crisis with the Taliban as the captors and the innocent women and civilians of the country as the hostage. Education and full equal participation in society is a fundamental human rights. The fact that the Taliban wraps their oppression of women in the guise of religious religion makes it even more worse. The vast overwhelming majority of Muslims throughout the world are appalled by the Taliban's treatment of women and oppression. The world's largest and most credible Islamic organizations, nations have asked the Taliban to reopen education for women and girls. This is not a question of the decadent secular West versus Islam, which is how the Taliban wants to portray it, as a clash of values or something that is a valid topic for debate. The total and complete operation of women is not a value. We need to have the backbone and the principles to declare that the certain toxic ideologies in this world are not valid period, and should not be permitted to rule over pe groups of people by armed forces or, or to const uh, constitute a government. There's actually a really short list of such ideologies. Nazism, Taliban, ISIS, and genocidal catastrophes such as the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia in 1970s. I put the Taliban in the same category as the Khmer Rouge because it's actively, severely oppressing literally half of the population of a country of 30 million people. Just because the Taliban is smart enough not to cause an international public relation disaster by rounding up thousands of people and slaughtering them in the killing fields doesn't mean that it's not engaged in a slow motion suffocation of a nation. Since the capture of the capital in 2021, numerous international organizations, government, foreign ministers, think tankers, and research organizations have published strongly worded condemnation of Taliban's operation of women. The Taliban doesn't care. It's strongly worded statements from the United Nations or some NGO in Norway doesn't even register with the Taliban. It sounds like, oh, Mr. Taliban, please be nice, otherwise we will show another strongly worded statement which will you not care about. The Taliban sees this as a, and it, they don't care. They know that organizations like Amnesty International and United Nations Committee related to Afghanistan are condemning them in excessively detailed and well-researched reports in PDF files published on their websites and it has zero practical real-world impact on their armed occupation of the capital. In the summer of 2021, when the government collapsed, I was sitting in my home office in Vancouver, Canada, 
I started receiving hundreds of messages from young women all over Afghanistan telling me what was going on. They sent me pictures and reports that the government's soldiers had put down their weapons and fled the country and taking off their uniforms and the groups of armed Taliban were roaming the city on foot and on pickup trucks. All schools for women and girls were immediately shut down and have not reopened since then. In the past two and a half years, my organization, Women Leaders of Tomorrow, has obtained 18 Fulbright scholarships for young women from Afghanistan to study at high schools and universities in Canada. We have, the five, have five high school students studying at private schools in Victoria and Vancouver area, a cohort of 10 master's degree STEM students at UBC, University of British Columbia, and others attending undergrad and graduate programs at several universities in Ontario. I continue to receive a high volume of applications and pleas for help from young women in Afghanistan and Afghans living as refugees in the neighboring countries. Among those messages and girls, there were also a bright teenager whose school was shut down in front of her eyes by the Taliban. They directly ordered her to immediately return home or risk being killed. In the midst of this chaos, I received an email from a group of 10 Afghan women stuck in Kazakhstan, unable to return home after the collapse. It was not only the students. My phone, my laptop, every possible form of social media and communication was flooded with the desperate pleas from the female athletes. Among them, there were the, the volleyball team, judo team, soccer team, and other sports. They all informed me that the Taliban had completely shut down their training and competitions. One of the athletes said to me, and I will never forget that, she said, Freiba, please save me now, otherwise Taliban will hang me. My only crime is that I played sport. Another one was beaten on her upper body by a Taliban with the butt of a rifle. Many young women kept fighting to gain an education because education is a basic human rights. For every full scholarship position I find funding for, those are, there are thousands of young women who might be eligible and have been banned from university. Some of these were studying in grade 11 to all of high school at the time when the Taliban returned and shut down all the schools for them. All of their dreams and hopes and future ambitions have been canceled and shattered, and they are now effectively prisoners of their own home in Afghanistan. Under the Taliban's new legal code, education for women is literally a crime, a crime which is punished by being lashed or being imprisoned. If they are lucky, they will not kill her. I call this the Taliban's gender apartheid. At this term has been used by many international feminist organizations around the world now. With half of the population being out of school and aren't able to join the economy, how the Afghans gonna feed their families? On average, Afghans have seven to eight children and now there's only one breadwinner. The husband or the father with the income of 100 50 US dollar or less a month, according to the United States. Now, the wife is also dependent on the father or the husband. So you multiply 150 US dollar or less a month on the population of 30 million people. I conclude my speech with a question to everyone. Women are banned from employment from going to the parks, playing sports, a 13 years old girl's right has been violated by the Taliban to get an education. Poverty has been significantly decreasing, and increase, sorry, increasing, and the situation is only getting worse and worse. World's attention is drifting away from Afghanistan. What do you think we should do? Thank you.
Thank you, Fribo, for that incredibly important thought-provoking talk. There's sort of many questions that you have, and if you have the opportunity um, to ask questions, I know Dina maybe have some that will start us off. And for those in the audience who are interested, we do have them um, um, back there up by Liz. We've got a microphone to ask questions. You can also ask questions um, virtually for those who are watching remotely. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Dina to st start with this piece and certainly think about things that you'd like to ask Friba and take this opportunity um, to really learn more about this incredibly important situation in the world. Thank you, John, and thank you, Friba. That was a powerful and important information that you shared with us, and I am unable to comprehend how these women are living and i just i i would just like to know how do you find the courage to do this work thank you so much uh, first of all and i also wanted to thank uh, mr uh, weinstein for um, having me and also thank you for your steadfast duty for supporting afghan women's education it's truly special um, and very very meaningful uh, thank you for your question when i was <laughs> very young in afghanistan um, I believe that if you're born, if you exist, and you have the right to do whatever you want to do. And when my rights were um, denied by my society, by my um, peers because of my gender, that made me really angry. And I started the fight for gender equality at a very young age, at um, age five, uh, because I saw my brothers were able to go outside, play soccer, and I was not able. To, and my brothers were, and the male cousins, and the, all the boys in the society were able to do so many things, but I was not able just because I was a girl. So that always remained in me. Unfortunately, it doesn't come from a very healthy place, but I used that anger and injustice to do better for other girls and provide the opportunity for the girls who never had the opportunity, like when I was a child. That's so interesting. Can you tell me how like, your interest in judo and other sports helped inform the work that you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, when I was younger, <laughs> I had a lot of energy. And I would always get into trouble. And my mother was really worried that what she would do with me. Um, yeah, uh, so uh, there was a dojo which was uh, supported by a Norwegian nonprofit uh, organization called Judo for Peace. And they were encouraging women to join. And um, I went there, I saw the dojo, um, I was very young, I was like 15, 16 years old, and um, they gave me the uniform, the belt, and I absolutely loved it, because judo is a very intense sport, it's high energy performance and high energy sport, and I had a lot of energy, so in judo you get to roll a lot, you get to throw people, you get arm bar, arm locks, and you even get to choke people, <laughs> so... Um, that motivated me because there was a, this was a very good fit. And sport is such a beautiful sport. Uh, judo is such a beautiful sport that it's fit for everyone, for all sizes and shapes. You don't have to be in a certain height and certain weight to, to do it yet. For competition, you have to be in a certain weight. But it is very inclusive, and I found it very suitable. And um, me starting judo back in Afghanistan, um, brought visibility to my rights and other girls' rights. And when I started judo, we were only three girls in the entire country. We were only three teenagers, yes. Um, there were other girls, but they were very young. Uh, so we were only three, uh, three girls, and I absolutely loved it. And I wanted to continue it because that helped me with the advocacy I was doing to include other women and to make sure that other women have the chance to come to dojo and practice uh, judo as well. That's really that. That's great. I think that it's it's incredible that you were one of three three girls who were doing this. Young women. Um, when I think about uh, Elizabeth Blodgett and her dedication to educating young people, I'd like to know what you. With the, with the current restrictions of the Taliban, what are the opportunities and possibilities for girls to get educated? Um, and what, would, what, what kind of challenges are they facing that we, that we are unaware of? The challenges are beyond our imagination. What could be possible in the modern time, time and age? 
Um, the challenges are, as I mentioned in my speech as well, that women can't even go um, outside her house, go to local, local park, go for grocery shopping. So getting an education in a physical classroom in Afghanistan is impossible because the Taliban will find out immediately and they will shut down and they will punish the families and the, and the girls. So um, with my organization, we, we find scholarships for young women from Afghanistan, who those ones who are qualified, who have the merit and the commitment to study and uh, complete a scholarship. So we bring them to Canada, and my hope is to USA as well someday. And I'm also working on a different project called Afghanistan Learns Online. This is an online um, teaching and learning platform for those Afghan girls who were not able to finish grade 11 and 12. So we can help them graduate from grade 11 and 12 in Afghanistan with the diploma um, or certificate that will be accredited and recognized globally. So after that, they can, um, they can apply for college and universities outside of um, Afghanistan. One of the challenges with that is that we are monitoring Taliban's movement about the um, internet. Uh, because right now, internet is life for Afghans in Afghanistan and outside. The only way that we can connect with the students and our family members is, is the internet. So I give it 50-50% chance that the Taliban will not uh, cut off the internet because they also need that for their propaganda and show to the world that they're better than uh, 90s. And 50% that at some point they may cut off. And then we have plans like plan B, like they would be possible to have internet through satellite. Uh, so that's one of the challenges. And one of the challenges that we face with online classes is that right now, um, each single student is studying from her home, from her living room with, on WhatsApp or Google Meet or Zoom. So the challenge is that sometimes they get excited about the project, they come together to study, and that's a danger f for them and for us. So as soon as they gather in a house, and if somebody knows that they're going to study together, this is a study group, they will tell the Taliban, and the Taliban will come after uh, them. So those are the um, challenges we, we are aware and we face. Wow. Um, I'm glad to know that you are having this program. Um, what's one thing that we can do right now to help Afghanistan women and girls who are trying to learn? Please speak to your admissions office to provide more scholarships. <laughs> No pressure, no pressure, thank you. <laughs> Keep the advocacy going. Um, I read um, Ms. Holt's um, uh, biography today and background where she emphasized a lot about education for youth because it's very important. The youth today is very different than they were previous, previously. The youth is challenging the, um, the climate change, the political issues, social just, uh, injustices. So. What you can do is that study well, get the education. If you want to bring change to the world for social justice, what, whatever change it is, you need to get the education first. Get the facts, get the facts and figures and present them because you can't challenge a king or a regime without the proper knowledge and the um, education. So please advocate for Afghan girls' education. Please speak with your neighbors, whomever you can, however they can help, even Helping one student at this moment will change one life and will save one life. Thank you. That's amazing. That's great. Um, are there questions that people in the audience would like to have answered? And again, if we could ask you to go up to the microphone there, that way it can be heard for our Zoom space as well. So back over there where, yep, yeah, thank you. Hello, can you hear me? OK, great. Thank you very well for coming. It's very, very inspiring to see you here and giving a talk and information, and also a reminder for also for us to see that there are people who are in, who are in need and who are actually fighting for their rights to educate. So it um, is a pleasure and it's an honor to be here and listening to, to you. Um, so I have two questions. Um, the first one is um, seeing young Afghan women uh, fighting for their rights, for their education, and advocating, and, and actually studying underground online, right? How do you see the future of Afghanistan in like, how do you see it? Are you hopeful? Um, 
And my second question is kind of personal. So throughout your journey, which I'm pretty sure you had your up and downs, right? Like fighting for and advocating for women. Um, who has been your role model? And um, who have been like you looked up for, like you looked up to while you were struggling and you had the challenge, but you were inspired by them? So thank you. Thank you for those uh, two questions. Uh, first of all, congratulations on your swimming, athleticism, and I want to see you at the Olympics someday. <laughs> and I want to cheer for you. Um, in relation to the question, uh, hopeful or not, I have no hope from the previous generation. My only hope is the young generation. Hope will exist and will continue as long as we have the advocacy going on, as long as we keep the voices of young women from Afghanistan alive in North America and everywhere in, in the world. Hope is the only thing right now that we Afghans are clinging on to. Hope is like the last candle burning in the darkness. If you turn that candle off, the entire world will die. So the hope is the only thing that keeps in, uh, keeping us um, alive. Um, for a second question, um, I did not have a particular um, role model, but I did watch um, Layla Ali's uh, competitions a lot <laughs> in our uh, refugee home back in 90s in Shower, Pakistan, in one of the small glass TV, which was connected by cable. So I watched and I wanted to join Sport Play Sport because she was a very strong role model for other women. And I want to look up uh, to her. Um, and in addition to that, the real and more impactful role model in my life has been the, um, the have been the young generation of Afghanistan, the, the young girls who came up to me and who came to me when I was white belt in Judah back in Afghanistan. They said that, hey, Freiba, you can do it, I can do as well. And those girls who came to me said that I want to have an education because education is my right and I will not be able to accomplish anything if I don't have the education. A great example is that when Afghanistan central government collapsed in 2021, I was devastated. I was devastated beyond words and imaginations in my apartment in Vancouver. One of the students from my uh, tutoring program who was 18 years old, she called me from Afghanistan and said, Freiba, the Taliban have uh, cl closed uh, my school, but I want you to find me a scholarship in uh, Canada because I want to become the first female president of Afghanistan. And this was the first week, the same week that the government collapsed. When she called me from Afghanistan, you could actually hear the U.S. evacuating its staff because her house was closer to the uh, U.S. embassy. You could hear the uh, U.S. Uh, military uh, helicopter hovering over. And there were gunshots. Kids were uh, children were screaming um, outside. Bullet shots were coming from, from, from the background. And, and I asked her, how this is possible? Given the situation, how do you want to become the first female president? And she said, I am young now. If you invest in me and help me in education, by the time I get my undergrad and master's program, Taliban will be gone, and I will go back and become the first female president. So these women are my role models. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, and, and thank you again for for coming and speaking with us. My question is really about the young people that you're saying are now trying to take classes or taking classes via internet. Um, can you tell me more about their families, particularly about the male members of their family and, and how or kind of what percentage of males are actually supporting their daughters or other female members of their families and being educated? Yeah, absolutely. So in Afghanistan, uh, families vary. There are families who are secular, families who are democratic, and some families are very fundamentalist and family of hardcore Taliban believer. These students we support um, through online education programs. Their families support them because they have educated and open-minded fathers and brothers who believe in a girls' education. And some of their families don't. They are just very rebellious. 
and they want to study online because they actually believe in the um, education and they want to harness the values that we have in um, in education. Sometimes we have challenges with the families as well. For, for example, sometimes during the tutoring program through WhatsApp or Zoom, you can see brother or father come just turn off turns off the uh, camera or the or the WhatsApp, and then we check on the, g the girl later. What happened? She tells us that her father or brother um, was not happy about the session and she that so it's it's a very um concerning situation um families um sometimes they support and sometimes they don't sometimes the young girls are on their own that's the reality yeah thank you so much um hi um thank that thanks so sorry um I, I, I um, for, for, for first off, I, I wanted to say your career as a martial artist has been really inspiring. Um, I, I, I think it's incredible um, as a competitive martial artist myself. Um, I, I, I wanted to know um, if there, if you knew of any um, news sites that were regularly reporting on the crisis in Afghanistan, and if you found. Um, ones that weren't particularly biased because I found that some more some news uh, projects that are, are reporting have been a little biased so um, I, I was wondering yeah thank you um, yes there are credible and uh, reputable journalism and news sources we can uh, rely on and we can read their reports so to name a few always um, New York Times uh, CBC um, the Witcher Willie internationally, and so many other news sources in uh, in the United States as well, Washington Post. Um, also, um, Afghan women have their own media as well. I highly recommend reading Zan Times. Mm -hmm. Zan in diary just means women, so they recently opened media called Zan Times. That's really good, and they do really good research. And also Rukhshana Media, which was awarded by the um, journalists and media production from Harvard uh, school um, as well. Yeah, thank you. It's important to read about Afghanistan, so I appreciate it. That's lovely. Um, thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Assalamu alaikum, Faribajan. It's great to uh, alaikum -salam. <laughs> meet you tonight, and thank you everyone for having me. Uh, my name is Akala, and I am a student at Bard College uh, right now in Annandale. Um, <clears throat> I also work for the American University of Afghanistan, for Bajan, you were talking about the students who are uh, continuing online. Our students, they have classes and they take our classes online. We recently built an academy bridge for them where the high school students and girls can complete their uh, high schools and then enter the undergraduate studies. So I kind of resonate with the experience that you have and all the challenges that you face and you're doing a, a wonderful job, and we are very grateful to, to have people like you um, on the ground. But uh, as I am with the girls and I am experiencing these challenges, uh, what's concerning me is the uh, voices that has not been heard. Uh, we have a big community of Afghans in diaspora, but uh, sometimes it's really concerning for me because they get so busy with their lives that they forget about the country and the women and the girls who cannot raise their voice. If they raise their voice, they will get killed. So that's 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 simple. So what is the rule of Afghans in diaspora? And um, I am curious to to hear your thoughts about that and how they can contribute to their countries back. Thank you. Thank you, um, Akla Jan. Uh, that was uh, wonderful. Afghans in diaspora uh, play a very important role in shaping Afghan society and justice for Afghan women. What they can do in particularly is to keep the advocacy going um, because now they're outside of Afghanistan, they have access to resources, they have access to an internet, high-speed internet, and uh, libraries and so many other resources that they need to gather and document Taliban's violation of human rights and women's rights and to fight uh, for it. And um, one of the reasons that I created, I founded Women Leaders of Tomorrow is that I want every Afghan woman to have a strong sisterhood to support each other and support another Afghan woman 
regardless her background, her education, whether it's education, sport, academic, whatever it is, she must support um, the other stu uh, female student. Those students whom I found uh, helped to find the scholarship in Canada, some of them are a very prestige, high-end schools on a very expensive scholarship, and they thank me for that. I said, no, don't thank me, but I want you to help other Afghan women, lead other Afghan women, create a space for other Afghan women, because we exist and we matter. So Afghans in diaspora absolutely matter, and we need to work together. We need to be united. We need to advocate for peace, because if we Afghans do not advocate for this, the Taliban are not going to change um, easily. So every single Afghan outside of Afghanistan is critically important. Thank you. First of all, thank you so much for your talk. Um, could you talk more about details about your journey from, you know, doing judo to uh, creating this organi this organi organizations that has huge impact on, you know, uh, women in Afghanistan and their education? And do you have any advice on? Um, students for us who have, may have like a specialized and we have our own major in concentration and how we are able to from all those different backgrounds be able to uh, apply this and then if when uh, if we really wanted to help how are we able to help with this thank you thank you um, my journey to the Olympics and the sports career was extremely challenging I must say that the Olympic was the best and the worst thing that happened to me. Best thing because it was the best thing I got represent Afghanistan as the first women, and also the worst thing because the threats that came after that, um, it put my life in danger as well. I was into hiding. I would receive death threats by um, telephone calls, letters dropped on my, at my home back in Afghanistan, um, threats from any random man outside in society because... Because of my look, the hair <laughs> I showed you put me on the spot. It was easily, uh, I could be easily spotted. And because the media paid a lot of attention at that time, but to be the first one, um, I got a little bit famous temporarily. <laughs> I got famous, so um, they were the threats. But um, I always believed in the principles. Um, I have strong principles, and I will always stand by them. My principles are human rights, women's rights, and women's dignity. And this will never change, and I will not compromise under any circumstances, whether like an ordinary Afghan man or lady or the Taliban. Um, and when I came to Canada, I applied to two big universities, Simon Fraser University in British Columbia and University of British Columbia, and I was accepted at both universities. So, But I chose to go to UBC because it was a nicer building. <laughs> um, and I started my advocacy for women's education and leadership to education and sports. And the, the reason I believe that was possible for me to do this work because I had a university degree and I am the first woman in my family who have a university degree because I wanted to have the education. I wanted education about the education. So that's very critical about your journey if you want to be uh, successful. Um, we also have a sports program. I still have a sports program. But the sports program right now is completely shut down by the Taliban and the um, Afghan National Olympic Committee, NOC, um, is completely 100% uh, controlled by the Taliban, which means all the sports federations. So when I started um, supporting women's judo team, I received a lot of threats, a lot of threats from my peers back home who were men and uh, the Taliban through WhatsApp, or they used those, the Taliban used those men to threaten me saying that I have gone too harsh on the Taliban and I'm an infidel, um, I am un-Islamic, I'm untraditional, but I always believed in the principles and I continued. It's, it's, it's still extremely dangerous for the work I do because I have spoken to many news sources. I'm not scared, but it's very dangerous what I do. I still receive uh, death or threats, but you have to stand uh, on that for the right thing because at the end, we must not and we cannot let, let uh, evil 
win over good. At the end, the good must win over evil. Because if you look, and I believe in the principles of women's dignity and educated young women, because educated young women are more powerful than men with guns. We have to really imply that, apply that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. It's really inspiring. And just to think about how when you stick with those principles, you will always find a way to, to be able to help and support the people who you care about. Thank you. Thank you. Assalamualaikum, everyone. Assalamualaikum, Friba. Before I ask the question, I will say tutorialisti. Because that's the only way. Oh, my Huba Sim, Shiba Huba Sim. But I'm good, thank you. Oh, I thank understand you. He asked me in Dari if I'm okay. Yeah, that's basically Chitorosti is a Farsi translation of how are you. Uh, my question is as someone who is, who has, as someone who is from an immigrant family who immigrated from Afghanistan to Pakistan a couple years back, I wanted to know more about the Afghani culture and the Afghani traditions and norms because that is a part of me that I'm not acquainted with. And I would like to mo know more because from someone who has lived their whole life in the land of mountains, that is Afghanistan. Sorry, can you please repeat the question? Sorry for trouble. I want to know just generally the culture of Afghanistan and the beauty of it because regardless of situations, I feel like Afghanistan has a very beautiful cultures, traditions and norms and I would want to know more about that. Absolutely. Um, Afghanistan has a rich history and culture. That's something that we take pride on. I take pride on. So we have music. We have beautiful traditional dress called Atan dress, where women wear and they dance around circles, and men wear white shalwar kameez, the white men's uh, traditional dress. And we have beautiful mountains. We have Bamiyan province, where the Silk Road cross, where Alexander the Great um, uh, crossed. We have beautiful uh, rivers. We don't have ocean, unfortunately, but um, the food is absolutely delicious. Uh, the I'm food. Aware. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Afghan music. Um, if you're interested, you can Google um, Afghan music and uh, listen. It's absolutely beautiful and really enjoyable. And you can join um, Afghan music. I mean, events in North America. Maybe ask an Afghan student if they have this Afghan Student Association or any other event or party and enjoy. Uh, the history is very rich. We also have um, Rumi, uh, Maulana Jalaluddin Balkhi. Afghanistan's very rich in poetry culture. Um, every Afghan know how to read a poetry and to re recite a few po poetry lines. That's absolutely beautiful and rich. Um, we also like to say that Hafiz is uh, from Afghanistan. He's actually from Shiraz, Iran. But the language is very similar, so that's part of the culture um, as well. And the language are really beautiful too. 100%. Shukriya. Yeah, you're welcome. Do you have uh, any further questions or I've any just questions got online? Okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, I know there's. This is like a great example of why we have a separation of church and state. You know, to have freedom of religion is a really important part of this country. Everybody is welcome, regardless of your background. But what I want to know is, what do you think would have to happen in Afghanistan to change the present mentality? When do you think people have had enough of the Taliban and revolt as a united people? The youth and women had enough of the Taliban in the 90s, and now they're having enough of the Taliban. Unfortunately, the youth and women are alone in Afghanistan. Nobody is supporting uh, them. We need to invest in the young generation, in the think tankers of Afghanistan and bright-minded of Afghanistan, to equip them with the education so they can start the revolution and the changes from within um, Afghanistan. Taliban know that um, they are not popular, they are not liked by the Afghans, and Taliban are not Afghans. They do not speak for me, they do not speak for any, uh, um, any Afghans. So that's obvious. Um, the change will happen once the, um, the population from within starts taking steps and the West starts supporting them. Because um, 
Statistically, the number of youth in Afghanistan is way greater than the number of the Taliban militants. So according to the United Nations, Afghanistan's youth is more than 60% of its population of 30 million people. So we have a force uh, there. We just need to um, help them. And very, very fl frankly speaking, uh, USA has been involved in Afghanistan since forever. Without the USA's help, it's impossible to achieve peace and freedom uh, in Afghanistan once again. Thank you. You're welcome. So we have a question from one of uh, our webinar attendees, mm -hmm. Natasha Charles, and they ask, are there opportunities for the girls to learn entrepreneurship in addition to social justice, civic engagement, and receiving an education? in an effort to gain economic power in addition to academic power? Yes, there are opportunities um, for those women and girls who are in Afghanistan, so the opportunities will be available for them online through the um, internet. Um, there is, there is um, an application called uh, Ehtisab, it by which is run by an Afghan uh, women. They support women entrepreneurship, women's businesses, um, and also women's leadership in the entrepreneurship. So um, we, I think the best method for this is to connect uh, mentors from North America with, the, with those girls in Afghanistan to help them find the right uh, resources. But it is possible, yeah, thank you. I think that we, we will be able to do all the questions for the people who are standing up there, so thank you. Then we'll probably have to wind down after that, but let's, let's get through all these questions. All right, so first of all, thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure to listen to you and your story and all the inspirational work that you've been doing. Um, I wanted to know about like the international organizations that you mentioned, such as the UN, Amnesty, Amnesty International. Do you feel like they're doing enough? Do you feel like they failed you? What do you think like, is going The on? international community absolutely failed me and absolutely failed Afghanistan and Afghan women. The United States, NATO countries, United Nations had a duty to respect and to protect young Afghan women's rights to, uh, to an education and to democracy. They did not do at all. Afghans have warned them years before the collapse that what is happening, what's, uh, what's coming, but they did not listen. They only cared about their political agenda. The United Nation is absolutely doing nothing except uh, issuing strongly worded uh, statements, which has n absolutely no impact on the, um, on the Taliban. You as the youth, you can advocate for this and you can write to the United Nations, Amnesty International, to get the report and challenge the United Nations work in, in Afghanistan. And you can advocate and remind them of their charter, of their bylaws, of their policies and policies procedures, how to um, support uh, uh, women and girls in Afghanistan. To be very honest, uh, when the government uh, collapsed, only a few countries uh, supported Afghanistan with the certain numbers. For example, Canada took a certain number of refugees from Afghanistan, so did the United States. But the international community overall all with the United States on the lead didn't do much, although they could, but they didn't. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Freva. Thank you so much for everything, and thank you so much for reminding everyone in here to not forget Afghanistan, especially with what's going on right now, and we really appreciate it. Um, I wanted to know about your advice for women who are going through this struggle of having their basic rights. Because we know some of the people lost their hopes. And we Afghan women have pressure from our family and friends to support them. So what's your advice uh, to stay mentally stable and healthy since it's really important in such situations? Thank you. It's very difficult. Um, the mental health is it's in decline. It's getting worse and worse every day. And the United Nations recently reported that how it is impacting and the, um, the depression is getting um, significant. Now, in my um, 
organization and the tutoring program, we also have mentors who help the students with the mental support as well. They have online workshops, they have online tutoring program where they help them like how to focus on their studies, how to stay focused on their goals. And uh, without such supports, it would not be uh, possible uh, to do that. So my advice would be for you guys in this room today, reach out to an Afghan girl in Afghanistan, however you can, to let them know, let her know that there will be a hope so they won't lose hope um, in Afghanistan. Yeah. I appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, so Wa alaikum as -salam. <laughs> Your story was like, like, literally, it was very inspiring for me. Like, I literally thank you. I want to thanks to all of the organizations that put you here today. Like, we literally, I literally personally needed that. And my question is like, very, you literally uh, shared your story, how you were the first girl or first lady who joined the sports back there in Afghanistan, which was like, literally was like very, very challenging and very hard. I literally want to know how you overcome those challenges. Like, were your family supported? How your, like, how were your relatives' uh, reaction? Did they, they support you or not? They were like, disappointing you. How did you manage to like, um, manage your mental health and f beside your physical and like all the threats? I really wanted to know that because like, I'm coming from the same background and I have challenged it. I also have like, I had those challenges and I literally wanted, I personally wanted to know that. Thank you so much. Yes, I certainly had a lot of uh, challenges. Um, when I was younger, I didn't know how to overcome those challenges, mental stress, the threats. But I, all I did, uh, I went to, I would go to my dojo, judo center, I would just train and train and train. Because those hours, one or two hours that I would train inside the, uh, the dojo, that would help me with my mental, uh, uh, mental health and stress. And also I would be away from those abusers just for two hours. And that was a luxury and that was vacation uh, for me. Um, at home I would come, I would just remind myself that Stand what do you believe for? What is the right thing here? Always think about the end goal, like always think of what's the value and what's worth it or not. And all, I always reminded myself that it's worth doing it, doing it because this is the only way. If you want to do it, there's nobody else who will do it for you. So it's up to you to get up, put on a judo gi, judo uniform, tie your belts and go and train because you have to set an example. And as I mentioned earlier, that motivation came with the anger. Yeah. <laughs> I'm much quieter now and calmer now. That came with an anger. So I used the way, I, I redirected the anger and the negative energy on the sports and my um, advocacy. And also, always believe in yourself. You truly matter. You are important. And you make the change um, if you want to uh, change it. So. It's up to you as well, and I highly encourage everyone to get up and uh, do something about injustice. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Well, I do have the task of kind of bringing us to a close. I'm going to give each of my wonderful panelists one opportunity for one more final word. Before I do that, just a little bit of housekeeping. One, if you're interested in reading more about Elizabeth Blodgett Hall, we do have the copies of the House of Education uh, Needs Overhaul outside, so certainly um, please take one of those. If you'd like to learn more, and, you, and I certainly suggest that you do learn more about Freeba and her work, we see you have various contact information. You can learn more about Women Leaders of Tomorrow and, and the work that she's doing, and certainly, certainly follow that. Thank you, everyone, who's made this possible. I do want to give a shout out to our crew behind the scenes, Jean in the booth, Monk back there on the um, live stream, and Liz managing the questions. And thank our audience, both outside, watching us from afar, as well as our audience here today. Thank you, especially those who ask questions. I know that that's challenging and, and, and a step to do that, and I re really appreciate that. This will be available um, as a recording on the Simons Rock Alumni Library website as well in our archives, so you'll be able to, to continue to view that. Or for those who didn't get to see Freeba Live, um, you can certainly uh, recommend that they watch, because I learned so much just from this evening. I've been fortunate to have several hours today with Freebus, who we could go on for like literally hours. It keeps getting more thought-provoking and interesting. I've learned 
something in each each of the each of these stages, but we only have about an hour and a half tonight. So um, to wrap up, and also just for students who are here, if you are taking this, if this is contributing to a requirement for a class, please sign up in one of the sheets outside so that I can tell your teacher that you are here. If you're here just for yourself, you don't have to sign, then we'd love to know um, who is here. Um, so with that, I'm going to give the opportunity to each of my um, wonderful panelists here on stage to have the final word, because I don't think that I should be having the final word this evening. So we will have the final word with these powerful women on stage here with me, and I'm going to stop talking now. Thank, I just want to thank you again and uh, echo what John said about learning so much this evening. And I would say that uh, this evening, one thing we did gain is a role model in you, and you have been uh, inspiring to the students here for what they can do next. And I, again, I would say go to Freeba's website, learn a little bit more. I love the idea of students here connecting with an Afghan learner. And I just wanted to say thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dina. Thank you so much, Stacy, for connecting me. Thank you so much, uh, John, for having me. It was an absolute honor and pleasure to be here. This was the best gift for me ever, to stand before you here and talk about Afghanistan and about Afghan uh, women. And I also wanted to thank you and the Bard College administration for considering to support the Afghan students. They truly matter. Um, it's very important, and it's a life-changing experience for them. Um, what is happening in Afghanistan is unforgettable, and we cannot let the world forget uh, what's happening there. So each of us who are in this room matter. We can change if we believe in the principles. Thank you again for um, her for having me uh, tonight. It was an absolute pleasure. Thanks.